Welcome everyone to today's presentation on fire resistance level design. This presentation will guide you through how to correctly identify the FRL for a concrete masonry wall. Presented on behalf of the Concrete Masonry Association of Australia, the industry association that represents Australia's concrete brick, block and paver manufacturers. Before we dive into our presentation, we're quickly going to look at some background information that will be of use. These being the relevant definitions and standards for FRL design of concrete masonry walls. The National Construction Code volumes one and two are used to identify the required FRL for a given situation. Volume one covers building classes two to nine and volume two covers building classes one and 10. AS 3700 outlines the design procedures used to achieve the required FRLs from the NCC. We will not be covering the news of AS 1530.4, which covers performance and alternative solutions to FRL designs in this presentation. The Concrete Masonry Association produces technical resources to assist designers and builders with using concrete masonry. For FRL design, CMAA Manual 55, Section B04, Fire, and CMAA Fact Sheet identifying the fire resistance of concrete masonry walls are informative resources that can be used to consolidate your understanding. The FRL is an NCC requirement for fire resistance that dictates the time and minutes which a wall will remain serviceable when exposed to fire. The FRL is constructed from three functions, structural adequacy, integrity, and insulation. Structural adequacy is the ability for the wall to maintain stability and adequate load bearing capacity. Integrity is the wall's ability to resist the passage of flames and hot gases. Insulation is the ability to maintain a temperature on the surface of the wall, not directly exposed to fire. Generally, FRLs are presented using the notation provided in the figure to the right. The structural adequacy of a concrete masonry wall is affected by the slenderness ratio of the wall, which dictates the wall stability. If the wall is not supported along either of the vertical edges, the following formula may be used. If the wall is supported on one of the vertical edges, the minimum value generated from these three formula is to be used. Depending on how the wall is supported, the parameters used will also vary. For walls which are non-load bearing, the structural adequacy value is irrelevant as the wall doesn't provide any structural support. Once we've determined our slenderness ratio from the formulas provided in the previous slide, we can use table 6.1 of AS3700 to align the fire resistance period with the calculated slenderness ratio. CMAA Manual MA55 Section B04 provides structural adequacy design charts for a range of concrete masonry unit and wall configurations. You may use these to empirically determine the fire resistance period for structural adequacy in lieu of the mechanistic processes shown beforehand. An example chart for a 110mm thick concrete masonry wall simply supported on all four sides is shown below. The insulation provided by a wall is determined by the masonry unit's material thickness. Coring of masonry units will affect how the material thickness is determined. For solid units with voids smaller than 30% or cord units which have been fully grouted, the material thickness is equal to the overall thickness of the wall. For hollow units with voids greater than 30%, the material thickness is equal to the unit volume divided by the area of the exposed face. Once material thickness is determined, table 6.3 of AS3700 can be used to identify the insulation fire resistance period. For the purposes of masonry design, the fire resistance period for integrity can be assumed to be the lesser of the values determined for structural adequacy and insulation. This is specified in clause 6.4.2 of AS3700. To put it all together, we're going to quickly run through a typical FRL evaluation of a masonry wall. The single-leaf concrete masonry wall has dimensions 4.2 metres 
by 3.5 metres. The units used are the standard brick size 230mm by 110mm by 76mm. Units used are cored with a total void percentage of 35%, a basaltic content greater than 45%, and have a density greater than 1800 kilograms per meter cubed. The wall is supported laterally on all four edges. As the wall is supported on at least one of the vertical edges, the minimum value generated from the following formula is used. We firstly evaluate equation one. As the wall is laterally supported on the top edge, the vertical span coefficient has been specified as 0.75. We know the height of the wall is 3.5 meters and the thickness of the wall is 110 millimeters. Hence, we evaluate the slenderness ratio using equation one to be 23.86. Now evaluating equation two. Again, we know that the wall is laterally supported at the top edge. Hence, a vertical span coefficient of 0.75 is used. Both vertical edges are supported so a horizontal span coefficient of 1 is used. The height of the wall is 3.5 metres and the length of the wall is 4.2 metres and the thickness is 110 millimetres. Summing this all into equation 2, we calculate a slenderness ratio of 21.13 for this wall. Finally, we evaluate equation 3. Since the wall is supported along both vertical edges, a horizontal span coefficient of 1 is used. The length of the wall is 4.2 metres and the thickness is 110 millimetres. Subbing this all into equation 3, we calculate a slenderness ratio of 38.18. We can now determine the slenderness ratio of the wall by selecting the minimum from the three values determined beforehand. These being 23.86, 21.13 and 38.18. The slenderness ratio of the wall is 21.13. Using table 6.1 of AS3700, the structural adequacy period of the wall can be determined. Our wall has a basaltic content greater than 45%, hence we will use part B's maximum slenderness values. Our wall cannot meet a 90 minute fire resistance period, as its slenderness ratio exceeds the maximum allowable of 21.0. Hence, our structural adequacy value is determined to be 60 minutes. Alternatively, the same analysis could have been achieved by using a design chart from CMAA Manual 55, Section B04. For a wall that is 4.2 metres long and 3.5 metres wide, we can easily see that the structural adequacy value can be determined to be 60 minutes from the design chart. As our masonry unit has voids greater than 30%, we must use the following material thickness formula. Material thickness equals net volume divided by the area of the exposed vertical face. Net volume is equal to the total volume of the unit times 1 minus the coring percentage. The calculation is shown here. The area of the exposed vertical face would simply be the area of the brick face. 230 millimetres times by 76 millimetres. Subbing these numbers into the material thickness formula, we can easily determine the material thickness to be 71.5 millimeters. Using table 6.3 of AS3700, we can determine the insulation value. As our unit has a density greater than 1800 kilograms per meter cubed, we will use section A of the concrete masonry portion of the design table. Our material thickness does not meet or exceed 90 millimetres. Hence, the 60 millimetre value must be adopted. Reading from the table, we determine our insulation value to be 80 minutes. Determining the integrity value is now a simple task as we know the structural adequacy and insulation values. Selecting the minimum of the two, we determine our wall integrity value to be 60 minutes. With that, 
we've now evaluated the FRL design for our masonry wall. It would be presented as a 60-60-80 wall when labelled using NCC terminologies. This wraps up the FRL presentation. If you're interested in learning more about concrete brick, block or pavers, be sure to visit our website. We publish a comprehensive catalogue of technical manuals, research papers and case studies, all available for free. We also have a technical hotline, which we encourage you to call, that provides free design and construction guidance, should you need it. We hope to see you watching our other presentations in the near future.